Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode. Please go to beyondafigures.com and sign up for our newsletter because I want you to be the first person to know about really cool guests we have on the show, like today's guest. Today's guest is going to spend a lot of time talking about how to build award-winning teams. We've talked about different aspects of building companies for the value of your team so that they can grow, understanding what you need out of your employees and understanding how you can engage your employees for long-term growth. Well, today we're going to get a little bit more specific. Our guest today has a great experience. She took over a family business, uh, this amazing coffee chain. Literally, I used to go to one of them back in the 90s, right at the point when Starbucks seemed to be growing everywhere. And yet she was able to compete and grow and then sell the company, even in the face of all the you know, incredible competition from Starbucks. So really impressive there. She's gone on to be a C-level executive in different companies and also fractional work there, has created her own leadership consulting firm. And now she has built a great company that is working with senior level executives on how to build high functioning teams. So this is where we're going to spend a lot of time talking today with this great background. I think the things that I think are going to be a lot of value to everyone to listen and kind of take out of it is sort of the value you need to put into building your own leadership capabilities, because at the end of the day, it does start with what you are doing and what you provide for your teams. So, I mean, sounds pretty straightforward, but evaluating and being deliberate, you know, since we keep constantly talk about how to be more deliberate entrepreneurs, I think it's going to be worthwhile. So listen to how our guest kind of walks through this. And then two, the next two things that are really going to be value and they're kind of combined is how to really drive engagement by soliciting opinions from your team and working on being able to show your value of their opinions. It's funny. I just um, had a conversation with one of my teammates about something that I thought they did brilliantly. And I was like, oh, that's great. Thank you. And I went off and they kind of came back to me and said, I put a lot of effort into this. It would be really nice if you kind of walked me through how you thought it was so great. And I realized it was like, I just was so happy that it was you know, something I could use, you know, for one of our engagements. And I didn't realize just that their needs to under better understand what they could do further to continue getting, you know, the type of work level that they want to. So it was like, okay, I need to show more value to their level of work. So this is great. Our guest today really dives into this and it's how important, but also how to be very candid in the discussions. Now we hear about this a lot, you know, don't frame it, you know, you be straightforward, but she also says to be very tentative. And the way she talks about being tentative in candid dialogue is to come from an emotionally neutral. I know when I have, I sometimes bring emotional impact when I'm trying, I'm like, oh, I can't believe you did this. It's like, you know, pull it back, remove yourself from this be candid in the discussion, but remove your emotional, you know, focus from it. I think I'm being a little off, but like, it's going to be very interesting how to, she guides us through these different things. So I think you're going to love today's episode and so much we can learn about how to build your team. So please let's welcome Annie Hyman Pratt, the CEO of Leading Edge Teams and the author of The People Part, a really great book. All right, everyone, let's go talk with Annie. Hello, Annie. Thank you so much for coming on the show today. It's great to have you here today. Yeah, thanks. We're happy to be here. Oh, cool. I am. You are in one of my favorite sunny places on the planet right now on the West Coast down in California. So I'm pretty jealous since we're having sandstorms here in Spain. I've been going through your background and I'm really interested in learning more about your new book, right behind you, the people part. But given this great experience you've had and everything you've been doing, where do you see yourself as an entrepreneur these days? Yeah, it's a 
It's a good question. First, I probably would start with, at the beginning of my career, I didn't even see myself as an entrepreneur because I came into a family business at first, right? My parents started the coffee bean and tea leaf in the 60s, and then I kind of grew up in the family business. And then I came back to the business after college when my dad had heart problems. And and then while I was at Coffee Bean, I mean, I was very entrepreneurial, meaning I did a lot to take the business farther. And yeah. I came into the business during a time when um, the beverage, the coffee beverage revolution was happening. So it's kind of like I came into a, an old mom and pop business and I got to really modernize it around the beverages, including a very famous beverage that we invented called the ice blended mocha. So all those cold blender drinks, uh, we were the first. But, you know, but because my parents had started the business, I, I didn't see myself as like a, a true entrepreneur. That came later. Uh, after the business sold, I was with Coffee Bean for all of the 90s. We sold it at the very end of the 90s. My family did. And after that, I started doing all kinds of interim work. And I had a consulting business. But even then, it took a while before I saw that as a real business. And so, so where I am now as an entrepreneur is I, um, first of all, I love my business now. I have a, basically a consulting and training agency, right? We help yes. entrepreneurs, specifically privately owned businesses with entrepreneurs that uh, need to build leadership team and infrastructure. And so that's what we do now. And of course, I, I really focus on the people part of it. And I see myself right now as having a, a, a business I love, B, definitely an entrepreneur that's had to do all kinds of first time things, right? Yes. So I'm in great company with all my clients. And, and what's kind of interesting, though, is that as an entrepreneur, I'm in a time where I'm ambitious, but not... Like I was when I was, you know, 20 and 30. I, you know, I'm more, I would say I'm more on the side of, um, I really want to have a great impact. It's like, I really want to mentor people. I want people to have the value of me having gone through some things and hopefully I can get them a little farther along with a little less pain. And yeah, so that's where I am. I'm and totally enjoying building my business and it's less about me now. How can yeah. I make sure that my my clients, my community, my friends, that they get the results they want? No, no, and that is very cool because it is that kind of on the journey you've because you've had these successes, you can now kind of you know expand on your definition of love. What do you think has helped you the most though now that you've gone on this journey, like you said, you went from growing, you know, and your family business, you grew incredibly. It was, you know, you took it from a mom and pop to an international business. So it wasn't like you were just sort of in the store. You were actually, you know, you grew it and by any other definition as a true business person, entrepreneur. So, you know, I just wanted to kind of touch that, you know, back on that first. But like, what do you think has helped you the most as an entrepreneur? Um, I think the all of the support and learning I got along the way. So the thing about being an entrepreneur is, uh, or even in a business that's, that's growing, or even as a, as, a, as a leader, is you are doing so many things for the first time, and things rarely go as expected. So I had a lot of great people along the way that helped me, right? That, like, that either would talk me off the ledge if I was having an anxiety attack, that would um, help me with, uh, I had a, a consultant who was fantastic at helping me set up an org chart, who helped me put together plans that were at a higher level for the company. I, I got to learn from some really good people. And of course, I didn't get to learn everything before doing it, but yeah. I had enough support that even when I fell or I blew it, I didn't feel how I would say most people, most entrepreneurs, I think f probably feel a lot more alone than, than, than I did during the journey. Like I, I had some good support around me. I think I was really lucky with that. And once yeah. I recognized it, I was really good about getting that in place. Meaning 
that even when I, even after coffee being sold and I was working inside other businesses, I was an interim executive in the C-suite. So I would yes. come in for six months or a year as a CEO, CFO, or COO, usually often around a transaction, help a company kind of get cleaned up and turned around and then hire my replacement and go. And because I had to come in and make rapid change, I needed everybody around me to learn the business I was in, to, to one that I was popped into. Yeah. And so I found that the better I could do with people and the less isolated I was, that that helped me the most. Now, okay, so this is going to be a very you know, basic question, but yeah. how did you go about because it's, I think for many entrepreneurs, we do try and, you know, we generally are, you know, as entrepreneurs, you generally have an ability to connect with people. But what I was fascinated was just your focus, your books and going through your website and stuff on building that connection, that kind of culture that yes. develops a connection between people. And I've had a few other guests on who kind of work in that kind of thing. And I think... I know I have a lot of difficulty in doing so in in a larger scale. One off, sure, even ten, but then as it scales, it's like, uh, wait a second. So, yeah. how did you develop this? You know, yeah. like you're saying to develop that connection. Yeah. So I think a couple things were going on. One, first, I had to learn a little bit about myself, meaning that I am a how would I say? In my life, I've been a rather high anxiety person, right? Mm -hmm. A bit perfectionistic, would like to control everything if I could, and I'm more introverted than extroverted. So that means, so one of the things with that, I think that's pretty common for introverts is that I avoid tension. It has to be really uh, super high stakes, and then I'll come out swinging, <laughs> but, but uh, for just kind of day to day stuff, it's like I really have in my life work to avoid uh, interacting with people, avoid with avoid tension. OK, so I had to first kind of recognize what is that about? Like, why am I uncomfortable with people? What what is going on? And I could recognize early enough, although I didn't know exactly what to do with it, but I could recognize like I feel a bit scared. Like, is this person going to think I'm um, saying dumb things right now? Is this person perceiving me as not knowing what I'm doing? That was because I was running a business in my 20s. That was a common thought of mine. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah, like kind of like, do they am I getting disrespected right now? Like, do, do they not respect, you know, what I'm saying, what what I'm trying to do here? And so. Once I could recognize that I was um, getting triggered, I guess I would say, that I was going to a fear place, that I, I had something to work on. And then I knew that, and I had some support uh, with some coaching for how to do that differently. For when I was feeling fear, to not do the thing that uh, was natural for me, which was to withdraw, which was to shut down which was to yes. uh, fold my arms. And I have a, a, a story. I don't think I wrote it in the book, but I have a, a story where I had, um, when I was at Coffee Bean, I had a very extroverted uh, director of operations. Uh, she was awesome. And so just a bundle of energy, right? And extremely extroverted. So I remember talking with her in kind of a, you know, a heated, passionate discussion. And we were standing in a hallway and, um, and, uh, outside her office. And as she was talking and, and things were getting a little heated, she was stepping towards me. Right. And I was backing up literally like we were like backing down the hallway. And, and I talked about this later with, uh, with a, a, a business coach, luckily a very great coach that I had. And he said, when you feel like stepping back, you actually have to take a step forward yeah. and then she'll back up. And you know what? It totally worked. And I think like that kind of thing was kind of life changing for me because it it said to me that um, how I perceive things that like kind of my natural way is not always the good way. 
especially if I'm not in a good in a good place. Right? Because her experience was that, you know, she she's stepping forward because she doesn't want me to exit the conversation. Yeah. She's looking for more of a connection. And so, yeah, so I think I think that that was like one of the things that got me interested in psychology too, of just like how do humans really work? What's really a play there? Yeah. Wait, do you have the manual? I, I, I <laughs> <this> <laughs> oh my gosh, I spent a uh, uh, oh gosh, I've been fa- uh, kind of a closet anthropologist my whole life, and I spent a lot of time uh, just kind of trying to get a handle on research what is going on with people and their psychology. And then, you know, I went to uh, a small kind of alternative university called the University of Santa Monica. I have a okay. California master's degree in something called spiritual psychology. And that program was excellent. And it was, even though it's called spiritual psychology, it's yeah. really the psychology of human experience. That's more what I would call it. Nice. And I learned, oh my gosh, just so much. And then I got to turn around and apply in the business. And that, that was a big pivot for my business too, by the way. Like that was something on the journey of where I went to this university more for personal reasons than business reasons. I, after coffee being sold, it was actually not something that I wanted at the time. I was not ready to sell the business, but my, my family was. And I grieved for a long time and had trouble getting out of that. Ended up getting a divorce. And, and kind of at a low point in my life, I uh, found myself enrolling in this university that a friend had recommended and it was life changing. Yeah. Having a business where you had done so well and, being, and then have it taken away, I could see very much that transition helping, you know, and then, you know, maybe I could see that being part of the reason why you're saying you didn't consider yourself an entrepreneur. Because yes, I think as entrepreneurs, we create our environment. Um, yes. even though that's just what we like to tell ourselves. But and yeah. control it, right? We, yeah. well, we get we to decide. Yes. yes. I yeah. am not happy. And I like your thing about not withdrawing because, yes, I kind of clicked on that. I'm like, yeah, maybe a little too much on my part as an introvert, as a fellow introvert. Of, yes. These are my toys and I'm taking them with me. I'm going exactly. away Exactly. Yes, exactly. <laughs> and it's how we, you know, humans are hardwired to protect themselves. Like we're that is, that's automatic for us humans. And we, I talk about in the book, because again, I'm like fascinated with the, the kind of the biology and the physiology of how our nervous system works. And we humans are threat detecting machines. And that part of us is so much older uh, evolutionarily than are the front part of our brain. Like where the great part of human creativity, complex thinking, interacting with other people, all of that is like up front here. But the triggers are more centered in our emotional center and our amygdala. And that catches threats long before we're conscious. And so our feeling of as an introvert of like, oh, no, this isn't going that well. I better exit, (laughs) like exit stage, right? Um, That is... That hits us well before we could even think about that it's happening. It is absolutely automatic. And, and that is, I think, one of the hardest things about being human is we have to learn to regulate that, to not let that run us, to not let that be the thing that uh, operates our behavior. And even though my most often when I'm in a triggered place, um, occasionally I'm going to be really angry and act out. But most of the time, if I'm just under a strong amount of tension, you know, again, I'm looking for the door, like I'm shutting down, but not everybody's like that. You know, I think we saw at the Oscars, right. And we'll, we'll have the opposite <laughs> happen to him. He literally lost emotional control. And at that moment, we like to think he was in charge of his behavior, but not really. So this will be a bit new by the time this episode gets up. But yeah, I think it is amazing. Just the Frame by frame, yes. You know, point out like he was laughing when the joke. Yes. Then he turned and looked at his wife, and his yes. wife was upset. Yes. And it, it was like he just switched off. He, you know, it was like 
Oh, okay, a joke. Oh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta, yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna, oh, wait. Wait a minute. Boom. Danger, right? Then, like, yeah. like, my wife has been insulted, and that's not okay. And I promise you, he was not thinking at that point. It was just odd. His, his emotions were running his behavior, which is superhuman. But if we can't learn to um, control that, especially in business, because the thing is, business has a lot of tension all the time. It's so hard. Yeah. I mean, what I found actually, even, yes, watching Will Smith and his group, was... Chris Rock's control on a few fronts. One, he did begin but stopped, and for he began to draw a fist, he yes. stopped himself. Yes. He held himself straight up. He went to immediately do the you know, because I've seen him. I saw him, you know, back in the eighties. Yeah. You know, doing public access channels. Of, he can attack, you know, hecklers. Oh yeah. And. He went to, and then he stopped himself. And there was a few things he did that I felt, you know, it was like, yes, the joke and, you know, oh, he should never, and it's like, okay. But how Chris Rock held himself, and that's the hardest part because he was attacked. Yes. And yet yes. he, you know, it's like for all the talk of everything, that's oh, yeah. what Chris Rock did afterwards, maybe before not. But afterwards, I thought it was masterful. Yeah. It was, ooh, that was hard. Really yeah. hard. And it is, and that is something that is worth getting better and better at in your life, though, is learning how to handle a really stressful situation without automatically reacting, right? Where you do get to have some choice. Yes. And maybe he can't do everything he wants to do, meaning, um, I'm sure, you know, Chris Rock looked back on the night and thought, oh, I wish I'd done this a little differently. But he certainly, you know, wasn't running on autopilot. He certainly had his wits about him and his self-control. And it's not easy. But it's so worth it. Because once you can get a handle on your emotions not controlling you, you can change them. I don't know how the how the exact saying goes, but it's it's basically they're finding now that um, mood follows behavior. It's not that mood comes first, and that's why you act like you act. Yeah, it's like I mean, you can you can act your way into a good place. Smiling um, just by going through the smiling, people have you know lower pain. Yes. You know all the things, and it's just the physical object. Breathing techniques. Yeah. Um, I had a business coach who, who called himself um, a born again Buddhist, um, and yeah. he just kept saying, "You know, you step into the fear. You know, it's a plate. Yes. You know, your fear. It's a plate." And I was like, "What does that mean? <laughs> what does <Sure>. that mean? <laughs> yeah, it's like okay, I step into the fear. What is that? Yeah, like those actions. You know, thought process of things. Your you know, the way you hold your body, all that will actually extend that pain, you know, fear, the anger, etc. More so than yes, mm -hmm. if you try to stuff it down and avoid it or um, not acknowledge it, it gains steam. Right? Then it's like a tea kettle with too much steam in it, and it's going to blow. So yeah. instead, if we can uh, acknowledge the fear and go ahead and feel it. That's, uh, it's one of the things of where I, I wish we were teaching young children a much richer vocabulary for feelings. Because when you can describe your feelings, they automatically um, dissipate because it happens here. Because describing yeah. your experience happens in the front part of the brain and that automatically takes the emotions down. But if people can't articulate it in their head or out of their mouth, um, they can't get a hold of it. Like Will Smith, if he could have caught himself inside his head and said, oh my God, I am feeling enraged right at this second. That's a, a feeling I can feel. I feel like going up and punching Chris Rock. But then he probably could have kept himself from actually doing it. Yeah. As you've said, that's something to really kind of practice leaning into. Yeah. And recognize that you're okay. I literally uh, think of it as like, uh, for myself anyways, I think about it as a, 
when I get through a really tense, difficult, often awkward or embarrassing or just a fearful situation, I, I, I tell myself, look, I didn't die. <laughs> like, like, I felt all that and I'm still here. Our ability to grow is really based more on what challenges can we endure so that we can learn. Because if we can't endure it, we don't have any chance to learn from it. So it's getting to a place of where you're like, you know, this may suck, but I'll be okay. That's the power place. Not, I'm going to get this to work out perfectly. Yeah. And I think that done myself and I know from other entrepreneurs and speaking, we have a tendency of like, I need the answer. I need to know yes. what to do. And the reality is, as you said, it is not, I think, a lot of it is just a little bit of incremental directionally correct effort. And then you'll soon be walking out the door and then yeah. you know, 10 years down the road, you turn around and you're like, wait, I'm doing this, but I exactly. didn't think I could do. Yes. Yes, yeah. for sure. One of the things that you're saying too, about like, you know, you turn around 10 years later, it's this thing too of entrepreneurs are so good at, at achieving. Like that's one of the reasons entrepreneurs become mm -hmm. entrepreneurs, right? Because they know how to get results. Okay. But the, the downside of that is that they expect results, great results too fast. When you can normally get results fast and then you can't suddenly, it feels terrible. It feels like something's wrong. And for us to really, entrepreneurs to really get to deepen themselves and like, no, this is a journey and it does take time. I know for myself, a lot of it is, it's like, oh, yes, I can achieve results, but the results never really matter because it's, in a sense, the puzzle of getting the results that's so interesting. Yeah. Yet, that's a period of usually high stress, the puzzle yes. part. So you're not, even though that's my favorite part, it's not a part of joy. You know, okay. you know trying more to more experience yeah totally oh my gosh yeah yeah we need the stress and tension to have the growth like otherwise yeah. if, you're, if all you are is comfortable you just you don't really get anywhere but yeah but it's funny because we spend a lot of time trying to avoid that and yet it is what we need yes it's horrible but afterwards it's like Remember the time I didn't sleep for three days and I right. bought myself Pearl and I did this and I built the database and somehow we launched on time. Yes. It's like, wait, what? Why is that cool? Because I made it happen. That's, yeah. Yeah. Well, what mistake, because you talked a little bit about like having to learn, and, I'm, and I may want to even go back to this because you said you had to learn to not follow your natural instincts. Was that for everyone because you're using reference of the um extroverted yeah um operations manager was that something you learned was that for that type of situation or because then i do want to ask you about yeah. the type of mistakes you would like to share yeah yeah you know that you think people could grow yeah. from so i have wonderful instincts and and certainly we we all do like we all have our super strengths okay so the thing is, is when I can't trust my instincts is when I'm uh, triggered, when mm -hmm. I'm in fear or upset or overwhelm or um, I'm exhausted or I'm in blame or self-blame. Like when I'm in an emotionally triggered place, that's when my instincts aren't right. That's when it's like they're driving me. So it will feel like I should, you know, shut down and exit a scene and mm -hmm. that will not help. Like it's just in most business situations, business situations are rarely life and death, luckily, at least in yes. this part of the planet, right? At least in the, yes. in the first world or whatnot. So, you know, they're not life or death, but we have a part of us that feels like it is. And those instincts to, you know, to fight, I think of it as fight, flight, freeze, or please, right? Please placate, get the, yes. get the, say whatever you can, any lie to get the Thank attention you. to diffuse. Yeah. 
And so um, those are the kinds of automatic responses that don't work in business because they're not from a thinking place. There's not, you don't solve a business problem by running away from it. You certainly don't solve a business problem by expressing your anger, by, you know, berating somebody or getting angry at somebody. Both those things hurt relationships. So now not only do you have the business problem that still needs to be solved, but now you have to fix a relationship. And by the way, exiting or withdrawing is not better than acting out. It's just different because when you talk to anybody uh, on the other side who's, you know, who's had somebody withdraw from them, I mean, that feels just as bad. I mean, it's basically abandonment. So we have these natural instincts that are such an urge in the moment and that feel right, but they're not if they're coming from a place of emotionally triggered. I guess that's what I'd say. So for me to learn that my thinking is not good when I'm not in a good place, but when I am in a good place, my thinking is excellent. That's kind of how I see that. And as far as mistakes go, I would say that like my biggest mistakes in business were because I could not get out of that anxious place. So meaning that I could have a, like a gambler's mindset of like, oh, that didn't go well. I better double down. I better, um, feeling like I have to make this thing work instead of being able to back up for just a second and look at the whole picture, right? So um, one of the uh, examples I give in the book is when we were building stores in, in, in the 90s, it was when Starbucks was also expanding very big. And they, they, had, they were public, they'd raised a lot of money, they could build stores everywhere. They didn't really have to choose, okay? But anytime they would pick a location, I would be thinking, well, we need to be right near them. Like they, they, they know better. And it was like this fear of missing out, right? This thing of like, if I don't get in there, I'll, I'll totally miss out. That was the feeling. And it was so not true. And so what happened is it led me to lead us leasing some not very good locations with very scarce resources. We couldn't do hundreds of stores uh, at that yeah. time. And I needed to be pickier. So that, that kind of thing. Um, I think that's also where the shiny new object thing can come from. You know, so for me, it w would be things like I would see something that Starbucks or another competitor was doing in their store. And I'd feel like we have to do that right now. My team was going, we can't do that right now. Like, what are you talking about? But I would get indignant. And, and really, it was from a place of fear. I think that's the thing that I couldn't recognize early on is that when I was in a place of fear and I wouldn't have identified it as fear, but I could have identified it as anxiety. Like I have it running in me that like we have to do this or else we're going to be um, in trouble. And it just wasn't the truth. That's something that I hope for entrepreneurs to learn really early because you can save yourself from really big mistakes of when you're in a really anxious place about something you're feeling like you have to do it because your emotions are running that's a good time to slow down yeah i kind of feel that i know from my own experience and then from talking with other entrepreneurs this that becomes so much more difficult when you're growing or you're in transition parts of the business because you think things are difficult starting things off and then all of a sudden you have a business and then all of a sudden you're like, oh wait, we're alive. Okay, we have some money. Yay, yes. I'm not, yeah, I don't have to you know, lose sleep because I can't do payroll. But now I have, instead of 20 responsibilities yes. at one time, I have 200, 300. Yes. And I know I've had difficulty in that being there, that kind of like, oh wait, I am, anxious yeah yeah because it was always like okay yeah no 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 i have other it's just this it's just but yeah i do think that is a good point yeah that really is yes and the stakes do get higher so it is natural to be more anxious right like mm -hmm. i i kind of think early on in a project or in a business um like things are working and you're like oh my gosh this is fantastic but you you didn't have to have it work 
not quite the not quite the same as like later if something doesn't work it's like you know it could be a million dollars <laughs> that was not the case on day one <laughs> And, you know, so stakes do go up. It, it can be more anxiety producing, but learning to get a hold of that so you can think. Yeah. And I think it goes to, like you said, that first thing of losing that fear, of, you know, that fear factor kind of coming in because yes, when you're later on, those big mistakes may cost a million, but they probably are not as impactful to the overall survival of the business yes. compared to smaller things it's yes. just yeah you know, we're better with how many objects okay one two yeah it's like yes. if i can count it and then yeah oh wait yeah. i i don't i can't count that right no i mean but yeah. yes it is that like idea yeah, that oh big yes scary so totally totally leaning into that and building your ability to understand yourself there that's yeah. a great piece of place. Now that you have this book coming out, you've had the success and you are continuing to build upon your success as an entrepreneur, as a business person. How do you go about though defining your own success today, but then also as you look towards the future? Yeah, I think my own success today is more about what can I contribute? Like, first of all, I definitely have to be Okay, like one of the other things I've definitely learned over time is like, if I don't take care of myself, I can't show up for anybody else. But my joy is to show up for other people, is to help my clients, my team, my family, um, to help them all get good results, have a good experience. Like that is my, that is my definition of success now. It's like, kind of what can I provide other people by being there for them by being the best of me so I can contribute and connect and all that. So that is, that's how I define success for me now. And I've realized I have to take care of myself to do it. I do think that one of the things that I feel very appreciative and some privilege too, is that like, I have had some good business successes so that yeah. I, I can be a little less stressed. <laughs> like I, you don't have to worry where, where our next meal is coming from. And so that part I really appreciate. I definitely still want to grow the business, but I want to grow the business not at the expense of me or what I can contribute to other people. I think that's where I'm kind of careful because I have had times in my life and in my career where I was pushing so hard for the achievements, for the business success that really everybody else in my life fell by the wayside. Like I didn't have anything left for them. And I don't think I even saw it that way at the time. I'm a really good mom, but I had years where my kids were little and I, I could do that. I could be there with them for the time, but my presence was not there. And if it's certainly a regret I have and it's, and it's fine. I mean, my, my kids are, are doing great and nobody's perfect. My ambition is sort of moderated by how I want to show up. And I would also say I am way more compassionate about for myself and for everybody around me. Like I, I, I feel very strongly like it's hard to be human. It is. We're, you know, we have all these emotions that aren't, well uh, programmed for the lives we lead today and yet we can't turn it all off like we are emotional beings that's that's one of the things i say is like you you have your senses you can't not smell smoke you're gonna smell, mm -hmm. smell smoke you're gonna feel threats you're gonna feel fear and anxiety and and joy and love and anger and you know you are gonna feel all of that so the thing that i think has helped me the the most is getting um more and more compassion and as I've um, grown and learned and, um, and aged is that compassion, that's how um, I release the anxiety. Because it's, it's like, it's so much easier to let it go when you can drop the judgment to compassion instead of thinking this should not be happening, right? So mm -hmm. one of my big ones was when coffee beans sold, right? My parents should not have sold it. That should not have happened. Like I carried that with me for years. 
And, um, and that was painful. And when I can come into a place of compassion around it of like, oh my gosh, we all had a hard time through that, by the way. Like, mm-hmm. you know, my, my, my parents were, um, uh, had a, a difficult decision to make for the whole family. I'm not just me. I'm one of five kids. So this wasn't, you know, this wasn't all about me. <laughs> and, and they had a lot invested in the business. Like they, and they knew businesses could go down. I hadn't had that experience yet. So, you know, they had all this knowledge and, and, and I could have compassion for me though, being 30 years old and having, you know, really great success and, and thinking that this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to be the bean queen forever. And then I wasn't, but instead of being angry, I, I finally came to a place of like, it's okay. Like life goes this way. Sometimes I didn't do anything wrong. My parents didn't do anything wrong. You know, like the, I felt for a long time, like I should have showed up differently. I should have done it differently. It's like, none of that's true. It's okay. Things just happen. One extra thing I'll just add with that quickly is I, one of the things I I say to entrepreneurs all the time is your compassion has to be greater than your ambition or your life will be torture because entrepreneurs have big dreams. And if you go big, you can have big falls. (laughs) <laughs> you know, it's like that's part of it, and and yeah. to survive it, you gotta be easier on yourself. Yeah, I I completely agree because I know from myself with high expectations, I've had successes in my life, but I've never had successes that I targeted for. Sure. Yeah. You know, yeah. You know, yes, three exits and seven. You know, all that nice stuff. You know, and the money is all good, but it's like. Yeah, I was going to be 20 billion. I was going to be this and this. And then it's like, okay. The problem is that compassion first with yourself, but then also with everyone else around you on that. Because that it was success just wasn't the success you wanted. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. I mean, you know, I, for a decade, I probably would have taken back Coffee Bean at any moment, you know? And yeah. after it sold. And, um, uh, but then after that, now I'm in a place of like, recently I had a dream that uh, I got coffee bean back. And I was like, I don't want it. <coughs> How did I get this back? I, there, there's no part of me that wants coffee bean anymore. I'm grateful for the experience, but I love my business now. You know, and it's tiny compared to coffee bean, but I love it. No, and I'm glad you do. I mean, and that's, that's what's cool. The book. Yes. The people part. Everyone will have links to everything below. Notes and on social media and everyone. So, you know, look out for the people part yes. by Annie Hyman Pratt. Yes. And how else should the audience come, you know, talk to you and see what everything else that's going on? Yeah. So please grab the book. I mean, this is a book that I wrote because people were asking me for leadership and entrepreneurial business books to recommend. And I didn't have any I could really recommend. I'd have parts of some that I could recommend, but I really wrote this yes. book because it's the thing I want people to have. And it, and it really is about the people part of business, about um, how to uh, interact, how to, how to get yourself to a good place and how to interact with people in a way that's most productive. So you guys can get the goals, right? So that's that's the first thing. The second thing is you can come to our website. So my my company, I have a wonderful company, I have an amazing team called um, Leading Edge Teams. Leading Edge Teams, mm-hmm. Teams with an S. And, uh, uh, and leadingedgeteams.com. You can go there. There's, uh, you know, there's all ways to contact me there. And, uh, and I, you can find us on social media too. All right, we'll have all that. Like I said, yeah. show notes and on our so and on the socials, so that way you can find Annie because it is they have some great material. I've been going through their site and I love it. Picked a few things that I need to kind of work on with my team. So I'm excited to doing this. Annie, thank you. thank you so much for coming on the show. I really, really appreciate that. Yeah. This has been great. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. All right, talk with you soon.